Good morning, I'm Joe Fryer. And I'm Stephen Romo in for Savannah Sellers today. Right now on Morning News Now, arrested. Breaking overnight, a dramatic end to a days-long manhunt in Texas. This morning, the man accused of gunning down five of his neighbors is in custody. We always said it's not a matter of if, but a matter of when the suspect can be caught. And we're extremely glad that today was the when. What we're learning this morning about where the suspect was found plus the one tip that helped lead to his capture. Also this morning in the red, worries on Wall Street after a major sell-off for regional banks. We'll take a closer look at what happened and why some experts say the timing is so concerning. Plus, the stage is set for a showdown on Capitol Hill as House Democrats push a new debt ceiling plan without GOP support. Pressure check, a new warning about a popular at-home medical device why those blood pressure cuffs from the pharmacy may not be giving you an accurate reading. And Utah Best, you heard that right. This morning, Utah taking over the top spot of a high-profile state rankings list, beating out California and New York. We'll tell you why and where your state landed this time around. Never been to Utah. I have to add that to the list. I credit the Real Housewives of Salt Lake City. Oh, I feel like there maybe you go. they had something to do with this. I, we'll have to find out. Right. I like that theory, though. We do begin, though, this morning with that breaking news we've been following out of Texas. Yeah, a massive manhunt for the suspect accused of killing five people has finally come to an end. Last night, the FBI's Houston office tweeted out this photo of Francisco Oropesa along with the word capture. He was caught hiding in a closet underneath some laundry. They, were, they effectively made the arrest. He is uninjured. He now will be taken to my jail and uh, where his new residence will be. Investigators say it was a tip that ultimately led to Oropesa's arrest. NBC News correspondent Sam Brock has more from Cold Spring, Texas. For almost four full days, authorities, hundreds of them, were searching for Francisco Oropesa with no idea by their own admission where he actually was. But now... We know where he is this morning, behind bars on a $5 million bond facing murder charges for brutally killing five people, the youngest of which a nine-year-old child. Now, how did this all come to pass? Police say that yesterday, early evening, about 5.15 local time, a tip came in through the FBI's tip line that prompted them to swarm a nearby town as there were so many thoughts about where this man might be. Was he in another part of Texas, perhaps Mexico? No, it turns out about 15 miles away from where the massacre took place in Cut and Shoot, Texas, where authorities there with Texas DPS, the U.S. Marshals, and also an elite Border Patrol unit went into a private residence and arrested Oropesa, uh, remarkably so, they say, without any injuries throughout all of this. Now, police would not answer questions about whose house this was, what the connection might be, whether it was personal or familial, they would not say, would also not even include whether or not this person was intentionally harboring him, just the fact that he was hiding inside the house in a closet underneath laundry and was ultimately handcuffed. You'll see video of him that appears to show Oropesa being taken by police where he is now in jail. Um, and we're going to be waiting the next steps here to figure out what the arraignment will be, when that might actually take place. But this ends what has been an incredible saga for this community and people here worried to leave their homes, walking around with firearms themselves, saying that this has completely unhinged them in terms of a personal sense of safety. Well, everyone now breathing a sigh of relief on that front, but certainly causing so much pain and consternation as now they're going to have to grapple with the fact that this man who has slaughtered five people is brought to justice and, and relive some of his details there as to what happened in Cleveland, Texas, something that has absolutely devastated people far and wide. In Cleveland, Sam Brock, NBC News. All right, Sam Brock with the latest breaking news. Thank you. Well, this morning we're waiting to see what will happen on Wall Street after a wild day yesterday ahead of a big Federal Reserve meeting today. The three major indices ended the day in the red with the Dow falling more than 300 points. Now, a lot of that was fueled by ongoing concerns in the banking industry. Regional bank stocks took a big hit. PacWest closed down 28 percent, while Western Alliance was off around 15 percent. All that turmoil provides the backdrop as the Fed meets today and could announce another interest rate hike. Caleb Silver joins us now. He's the editor-in-chief at Investopedia. Caleb, good morning. So first, let's talk about that sell-off yesterday. Bank stock hit hard. Was J.P. Morgan's takeover of First Republic Bank earlier this week, was that not enough to ease the concerns of investors? 
Yeah, CEO Jamie Dimon saying the crisis is over, but the crisis isn't over. Why? Because a lot of these regional banks are facing pressure on their balance sheets. These rising interest rates have made it very hard for them to loan money at a profit, but it's also put pressure on where they put our money. When we give it to the bank, they put it in government bonds, they put it in mortgage-backed securities. Well, we know the price of those dropped precipitously last year. So their balance sheets aren't looking great, and investors are looking at all these banks very skeptically. First Republic was generally a very healthy bank. The fact that it had to get taken over, first it had to have that $30 billion infusion, then get taken over by J.P. Morgan. Not a good sign for regional banks that just do plain vanilla banking. That's the concern there. And we have another rate hike coming probably this afternoon. That's going to continue to put pressure on banks and on businesses around the country. Yeah, so, Caleb, let's talk about that. The Fed's meeting today. Most are expecting to raise interest rates by a quarter point. What do you expect? Absolutely, I would expect the Fed to increase rates by another quarter point. This would be the 10th straight rate hike going back now about 14 months, and this would bring interest rates to about 5% to 5.25%. We haven't had rates that high since the great financial crisis. You know what happened then, but the Fed is doing this to battle inflation, which remains sticky high. It has chosen to fight that battle and not be too concerned about what's happening in the banking sector, even though what's happening in the banking sector is providing its own form of restrictive policy. So the Fed is uh, bent on lowering inflation, and it's around 4.6 percent, according to the latest PCE, Personal Consumption Expenditures Index. They want it close to 2 percent. But this might be the last rate hike for a while. If you look at the projections from the Fed, that could provide some relief to banks and to investors. And Caleb, talking about issues before the Fed, of course, looming large is the debt ceiling fight, the possibility the U.S. could actually default. Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen says the government could run out of money as early as June 1st if that ceiling isn't raised. So can the Fed do anything at all to try to shield the economy if that happens? Well, they could lower interest rates. That would help. That would provide some relief. But remember, when the Fed lowers interest rates, especially when they do it dramatically, it's a sign that things are not well with the economy. And the debt ceiling is just another factor that we have to think about. Because if we do default on our debt or if we run out of money, first of all, some bills aren't going to get paid. But also the big issue there is what happens to our bonds. The U.S. government bond is the most widely held, most widely trusted asset on the planet. If we get a default because we can't uh, raise the debt ceiling here, we're going to see another spike in bond yields and a spike in interest rates, and that's going to be very difficult for the economy, for investors, for banks, for everybody. June 1st, uh, less than a month away now. All right, Caleb Silver, thank you. Thank you. Lawmakers in Washington are also focused on the debt ceiling, another economic concern, hoping to avoid a catastrophic default. With both sides still far apart, House Democrats are moving forward with a so-called Plan B, would allow a debt ceiling bill to be brought to the House floor without the support of House Speaker Kevin McCarthy and fellow Republicans. We're joined now by NBC News congressional correspondent Julie Serkin. So, Julie, good morning to you. So, House Minority Leader Hakeem Jeffries sent a letter yesterday to colleagues explaining the plan. Let's be clear. This sounds like a long shot, but explain what it entails, how it would be implemented, and what are some of the challenges that could potentially get in the way. Yeah, let's work backwards here, because the biggest challenge Democrats have here is that they're not in the majority, so they need to peel away five Republican votes, essentially convince five Republican members to cross their party leadership and go along with Democrats' plan here instead. The way this works is basically an obscure procedural process. This idea was born back in January by a little-known Democratic member from California who started a backup plan, not just to address the debt ceiling, but also on abortion and other issues that he said, uh, told my colleague Kyle Stewart, uh, was afraid that Republicans would try to hold hostage. Now, after it became clear we are just weeks away for a from a potential default, this plan was set in motion. Democrats uh, starting yesterday to set what's called a discharge petition in motion. Essentially, if they get 218, if they get the majority and those five Republicans are able to sign on to it, they can cross Speaker McCarthy, bring up this plan that would essentially raise the debt ceiling clean without any strings attached. But other than that, we haven't seen many details, and it's because this plan is just really unlikely to happen. So in the meantime, then, President Biden's going to host congressional leaders from both parties next week at the White House. They're going to discuss the debt ceiling. Despite that ceiling being raised numerous times over the years under both Republican and Democratic presidents, there are a number of Senate Republicans who are still dismissing the possibility of a short-term debt limit increase, right? Yeah, exactly right. And what House Republicans have going for them is that for the first time in a long time, Senate Republicans are hands off. They think Speaker McCarthy can totally handle this, especially after he was able to pass, narrowly pass, but pass, 
that Republican-only bill last week that would raise the debt ceiling but had a lot of spending cuts to the tune of $4.8 trillion over 10 years. Let's take a listen to what Minority Leader McConnell had to say yesterday about giving McCarthy the roadway here. There is no solution in the Senate. We have divided government. The American people gave the Republicans the House. The Democrats have the presidency. The president and the speaker need to reach an agreement to get us past this impasse. So President Biden invited all four leaders to the White House next week. But you hear you hear McConnell here saying that he's going to let McCarthy lead this one. All right. Julie Serkin. Julie, thank you so much. The Biden administration has announced plans to send 1,500 troops to the United States' southern border as COVID restrictions are set to be lifted next week. Known as Title 42, the measure is put in place at the start of the pandemic, prevented migrants from crossing into the U.S. to seek asylum. With its end, though, just more than a week away now, officials are preparing for a surge in migrants. NBC News Homeland Security correspondent Julia Ainsley joins us now with more on this. Julia, so what do we know right now about this plan and what were the troops actually be used for? Well, we know this will be 1,500 additional troops. These are active duty troops this time, not National Guard, which means that these are people who will be coming in uh, really to be doing the job, sort of the behind the scenes job that some Customs and Border Protection agents are doing now to allow them to go out and be more fully present along the border. So they'll be doing things like checking inventory in warehouses. They'll be pulling data on who these migrants are who are coming and how many there are at certain places to make predictions about if they need to search resources to one place or another. They're also just going to be doing anything they can in a supportive role to be able to get men and women from the Border Patrol back out on the border and away from their desk. But what they won't be doing is arresting or processing any migrants. They really won't be having any interactions with the migrants themselves. And that's because of U.S. law, a very old U.S. law under the Posse Comitatus Act that prevents the U.S. military from enforcing U.S. law within its jurisdictions. And so because because of that, that means that the military really can't touch these migrants. It was the same thing that held true under the Trump administration when they surged over 5,000 troops to the U.S. border uh, before what President Trump then considered a caravan coming to the border, although that turned out not to be uh, as big of a deal as what we're about to see now, which is really going to be an unprecedented record surge in migration when these COVID-19 restrictions are lifted next week. So a support role here and not actually law enforcement. So what's the significance of sending active duty military then instead of more border patrol agents who could act as law enforcement? Well, it would take some time to find those people. They're already the largest federal law enforcement uh, uh, law enforcement body in the country. They have 60,000 people working for Customs and Border Protection overall. Hiring those people, though, would be long, would be an arduous process, trying to train them. They believe that with active duty military, they can get these people down there and set up very quickly, very rapidly, and deploy them um, in a matter that it's really what they need right now, considering that this deadline is coming just next week. And Julia, we know this is uh, the third time now that the Biden administration has tried to end Title 42 and it hasn't quite taken. Is it really going to happen this time? And if so, how fast can we actually see that surge of migrants? It definitely looks most likely this time. There aren't any major court challenges that we're expecting. Last December, the Supreme Court put a hold on that when they agreed with some Republican states that it was not the right way to lift Title 42. In this way, though, it's ending because the public health emergency for COVID-19 has ended. So there's really no longer a legal justification to keep Title 42 in place. And so it's most likely to lift. And then that would be at 11.59 p.m. on May 11th. So that means really into May 12th, at the end of next week, we should see more migrants coming in. Not necessarily that they'll all be allowed in at once. In fact, the Biden administration has placed some more restrictions that they're going to enact when Title 42 lifts, including requiring migrants to either sign up on an app to make an appointment for an asylum screening or if they haven't already crossed through a country where they could have claimed asylum early 
earlier and claimed asylum there, they'd be ineligible when they come into the mm -hmm. U.S. But even with all that in place, really what's happening here is a messaging problem. Most of these migrants come because the smuggler or coyote tells them now is the time to cross the U.S. border. With the idea of these restrictions lifting, restrictions that have kept over 2.5 million migrants from coming into the U.S., that message is very clear. Now's the time to come to the United States. And we know, for example, in Juarez, just across the border from El Paso, there are over 35,000 migrants waiting in shelters to come in. Those people have been waiting a long time. There's a lot of pent-up tension and demand to come into the U.S. right now. So much misinformation there for those migrants who really do think that they are not doing anything wrong when they hear about these changes. Julia Ainsley, thanks so much. If you caught the late night shows last night, you may have noticed they were reruns and Saturday Night Live may not finish its season. That's the impact of the film and television writers strike, which is already being felt on our screens. Among the main sticking points, the streaming boom, concerns about declining pay, plus how artificial intelligence could be used to write scripts in the future. Brian Steinberg is senior TV editor for Variety. He joins us now with more. Brian, good morning to you. So both sides failed to make progress yesterday. I mean, is this looking like it is going to be another lengthy strike like the one we saw back in 2007? Right now, both sides seem dug in. I think both sides are under economic duress, riders because of the situation with streaming, but also the, the media companies, you know, Comcast and Disney and Paramount are all under tremendous Wall Street scrutiny to drive more profits. So, Brian, uh, you know, we may not feel the full impact of this till the fall season if this gets into the shows that are supposed to start debuting then. But already last night, we're seeing late night talk shows, which are already struggling with declining viewers. They're the first ones impacted here. How are they going to be able to handle this if this goes on for weeks, even months? You know, there is a roadmap from the past. The late night shows did come back about two months in. You saw David Letterman, of all people, strike a deal with the writers on his own. And that brought his show back. And then I think Jay Leno came in doing his own monologues for a while. So these shows can come back, just take some negotiation. And James Corden may have been wise to end his show last week, maybe foreseeing that this was coming. You know, one of the big issues that they certainly did not have to deal with back in 2007 is the concerns over AI, literally chat GPT, writing content for shows. Here's how one writer put it. Some of the most shocking ones, for instance, seem like the most common sense, like, hey, we want protections from any future AI stuff. It's like, we just want to make sure that there's still people in the room, not robots doing stories for us. I think a few months ago, we would have said, well, this is not a legitimate concern. Now we hear all this concern about ChatGPT. How is the Trade Alliance responding to this particular concern? Is this a big issue? It is a big issue. I mean, it's not the big one on the table, but it certainly is a concern to writers who feel that a function they do, you know, uh, creating things uh, out, of, out, of, out of whole cloth might be usurped by, by a machine. And I think there's been some experiments where they've asked these, these chatbots to, like, you know, write a, write a thing about White Lotus. And it has this. It may not be the best thing in the world, but this is early days. And I think the writers want to try and get in front of this now, whereas the media companies like, like to delay it and maybe think about it down the road. And that's on top of all the concerns about streaming as well. All right, Brian, thanks so much for joining us this morning. We appreciate it. It's important to note that Comcast, the corporation that owns NBC Universal, is one of the entertainment companies represented by the Alliance of Motion Picture and Television Producers. All right, let's take a look at your morning news now weather forecast. Meteorologist Angie Lassman joins us now with more. Good morning, Angie. Morning, guys. We've got a couple of systems that we continue to watch focus towards the coast, and it's still leaving us unsettled in some spots. Here's one of them. You can see uh, the northeast impacted this morning with some showers, some snow showers as well. In those highest elevations, we're still dealing with some snow falling, and we still have the scattered showers around for at least the rest of the day today. This broad area of low pressure is going to eventually start to work its way a little farther to the east and offshore. That is when we'll start to see some improvements, but that doesn't happen really until tomorrow. We'll have just a couple of lingering showers left over into your day tomorrow uh, as the wind starts to calm down as well. Temperatures, though, they will stay below normal. We'll have to wait a little longer for those to rebound. When it's all said and done through at least the later parts of today, we could pick up maybe another quarter of an inch of rain on top of all that rain that we've seen for days and days now. Meanwhile, out west, we have a low-pressure system that's sitting just offshore. It spins just offshore over the next day or so, 
before it kind of starts to work its way east. With that, again, some rain showers, some snow showers, picking up additional snow for parts of the Sierra Mountains. And then we'll start to see it work a little farther to the east. We'll add some uh, late day severe weather possibly for the day tomorrow, as well as parts of the Rockies ending up with a little rain and a little snow into tomorrow. Here's the area that we're watching for uh, some, some stronger storms into the afternoon hours today. We'll look for the potential for some strong wind gusts, maybe 60, 65 miles per hour. Isolated hail will be up to an inch. The tornado risk will be low today. But as we get into tomorrow, some of that same area, including Oklahoma City into southern portions of Texas, will have a slight risk of seeing some stronger to severe storms into the afternoon and even evening hours. This will include the biggest impact potential hail. We'll see potentially up to two inch size hail. So some large hail as well as some strong winds. And of course, we can't rule out those tornadoes. This is the area that has the best chance to see the baseball size hail. So just watch for that if you're in somewhere like San Angelo into the afternoon hours tomorrow. Here's what it looks like as far as the temperatures are concerned. We are quite divided, aren't we? We feel like summer into portions of the central United States. Meanwhile, the northeast is feeling a little chilly. 46 degrees for Buffalo, 55 for Philly. That's a below normal temperature for sure. And that trend sticks with us in the Northeast, at least through tomorrow. But if you're looking for some springtime air, don't worry. By the time the weekend rolls around, we'll actually have some much nicer conditions. We'll have temperatures closer to normal, upper 60s for New York on Saturday. If you have some plans for the first half of the weekend, it gets to be 73 degrees by Sunday and wow. a little more sunshine. That's I know it's been kind of dreary. So yeah, that's especially the question on weekends. Asked. Exactly. I would, love Who'd have thought we'd say, let's get that Fargo heat out here. Yeah, right? <laughs> get that Fargo heat out here. All right. Thanks, Angie. Welcome back. The college town of Davis, California is on edge this morning after three stabbings have happened in under a week and left two people dead along with another person injured. Now local authorities are teaming up with the FBI in their search for this stabber. NBC News correspondent Nyella Charles has the latest on this manhunt. Students on high alert with authorities working around the clock in Davis, California. After three stabbings in less than a week, leave two dead and one in critical condition. Families in mourning. He was on his way back home. He was literally five minutes away. And students on edge. You don't really feel safe anymore. And that's, that's really, really disheartening, especially in a city like this where I was able to walk home every evening and feel safe. A manhunt for a suspect still underway. The FBI is helping the local police department. We're a small agency. Detectives sleeping under their desks for a couple hours, staying away from their families. Police say two of the incidents have similar suspect descriptions, but they don't have hard evidence linking the crimes together. All three assaults happening within two miles. These were uh, not stabbings where a, a person would normally be a victim of like a robbery or something like that, where there's just a couple of wounds. There were many and very significant uh, knife wounds. Davis is a quiet college town. and the county it's in usually sees fewer than 10 murders a year, according to state figures. At UC Davis, students are scared as they mourn one of their own. I don't want any of my friends to be like walking home like late at night. 20-year-old UC Davis student Kareem Abu Najim was killed Saturday, just weeks from graduation. His father heartbroken, honoring his son's accomplishments. He even thought exceeded us. We're so proud. I do it with him. Just two days earlier, 50-year-old David Bro was killed in a nearby park. He was known as the compassion guy. David was one of the most kindest, compassionate people you'll ever know. He literally set out in this world to do good. In the latest stabbing, a 64-year-old woman is fighting for her life after getting stabbed inside a tent at a homeless encampment. Witnesses say they saw the suspect. I said, hey, bruh, he starts walking normal. And then I said, you look like a dude that they've been describing. I've been stabbing people. And he takes off. I started to take off after him. And then my wife's like, don't leave me here. The brazen nature of the crimes shocking even police. The suspect didn't seem to um, care that there were several witnesses who could identify him. Our thanks to Nyella Charles for that report. Law enforcement says that they're taking extra steps to keep the public safe. They've added additional officers to patrol the area, and they're offering escorts for students on campus. They're also warning people not to travel alone at night.
Fired Memphis police officer Preston Hemphill will not face criminal charges for his involvement in the traffic stop that led to the death of Tyree Nichols earlier this year. Shelby County District Attorney Steve Mulroy says that Hemphill was at the scene of the traffic stop and fired a stun gun at Nichols as he was running away. But the DA says that Hemphill was not present at the second scene where Nichols was seen on video being beaten by officers. Hemphill was fired in February after an internal investigation by the Memphis Police Department showed that he violated and several department policies. The prosecutor says his office spoke with Nichols' family and their attorney, Ben Crump, and they support the decision not to press charges. All right, so world headlines now. Starting with breaking news, more than 100 people arrested across Europe as part of a major mafia bust. NBC News foreign correspondent Raf Sanchez joins us from Tel Aviv with that and other world news. Raf, good morning. Hey, Joe. Hey, Stephen. Yeah, breaking this morning, more than 100 people arrested as part of a major bust of one of Italy's most powerful mafia groups. Authorities say the arrests were made across Germany, Spain, and Italy as part of a three-year investigation. Italian Carabinieri police mounted raids using helicopters and say they recovered cash, drugs, and weapons. In Sudan, the warring factions have agreed to a new and longer ceasefire, but it's unclear if the agreement will really do much to end the fighting. Ceasefires have been in place for days, <clears throat> but civilians in the capital of Khartoum say airstrikes and shooting is continuing. Sudan's health ministry says 550 people have been killed so far. And finally, Australia is cracking down hard on vaping, trying to get teens to stop puffing. The Australian government says vaping was sold as a way to help smokers quit cigarettes, but it's instead become a new addiction for teenagers and even young children. The new rules ban the import of non-therapeutic vapes and restricts the use of brightly colored advertising. So guys, a lot of governments around the world will be watching closely to see how these bans go. Guys. Yeah, a lot of people taking a look at that. All right, Raf, thank you. A British teenager is set to rub shoulders with the royal family at this Saturday's coronation of King Charles. The 13-year-old was invited to the event after he raised nearly a million dollars for charity by camping out every night for a stunning length of time. NBC News correspondent Ali Aruzi has the inspiring story. It's a once-in-a-lifetime invitation. The chance to be inside Westminster Abbey on Saturday watching the historic coronation of King Charles. And sitting amongst members of the royal family and world leaders will be a 13-year-old boy with an incredible story. Max Woozy has broken a world record and raised nearly a million dollars for charity, and all thanks to a tent. To be able to say that I went to King's coronation at 13 years old is a huge honor for me and it's a little bit crazy to say that i can go there like i said just because i've slept in the tent so it'll be it'll be a brilliant day max's inspiration came from a family friend and neighbor rick abbott who had terminal cancer rick gave max a tent and told him to have an adventure after rick died max kept his promise camping out to raise money for the hospice that cared for his friend at first, he expected it to last a few weeks and raise a hundred pounds. But Max stuck it out every night for three years. As you can see, it's getting wow. Surviving storms, frosts, and heat waves. Well, there have been lots of times when my tent's been broken. It's 12 o'clock at night. You're having to try and find a new tent, pitch one up. It has been horrible. But I always knew that the money was going to such good cause. You kind of had to keep on going. The adventure took him to the garden at number 10 Downing Street, rugby stadium pitches, and even London Zoo, winning praise from the likes of Bear Grylls, Boris Johnson, and his rugby icon, Johnny Wilkinson. Keep going. You are doing something amazing, not just for yourself, but most importantly, helping other people. Good for you. Wishing you all the best. Just keep enjoying yourself. Find ways of getting better. No matter what happens to you, just find a way to get better and find passion and opportunity and everything. He was rewarded with the British Empire Medal and on Saturday will be honoured again. Little did Max know at the time that all of his remarkable charity efforts would culminate into an invitation to King Charles's coronation here at Westminster Abbey on Saturday alongside other community and charity heroes. Except this time, Max won't be pitching up a tent. Max is now back in his bedroom, but is planning to get back in his tent for his next charity adventure. 
camping in every Premiership rugby stadium pitch in the UK to raise more money for local hospices. Ali Uruzi, NBC News, London. All right, what a great story, Ali. Thanks for that. We're back with a look at America's top states. U.S. News & World Report is out with this year's list of the best states. That's right. The rankings measure each state based on a series of factors, including health care, education, and the economy. And according to this year's list, states in the West and Midwest are proving to be the best in show, beating out big names like New York, California, and Texas. In fact, those three states didn't even crack the top ten. Wow. Well, joining us now to talk about this is Morgan Felschner. She's the executive editor of News and Events of, at U.S. News and World Report. Morgan, good morning. Thanks for being here. So, if you will, walk us through this year's top 10 states and how you decide on this list and, and also your big takeaways this year. Definitely. Thanks so much for having me. So the, the best states rankings draw upon more than 70 metrics and tens of thousands of data points. And we're really trying to measure how well U.S. states are performing for their residents. We aren't necessarily trying to find the best place to live. Uh, so things like weather aren't included, but we really want to find the state's where they are truly delivering for their residents. And this year, the top state is Utah. So let's talk more about that number one pick. I, first of all, I like Minnesota, number five, for that. <laughs> I saw that. Uh, but Utah, number one, that's going to be stunning, I think, to maybe some people. Folks who live in Utah are probably like, hey, it's about time. Uh, it beat out Washington for the top spot. How did Utah get the title of best state? Sure. So consistency is key across the eight categories that we consider. And Utah and Washington, which is number two and also had, had fantastic ranking, um, achieved top 20 results across seven of the eight categories. So that really pushes them to the top. And they achieved top 15 results across six of the eight categories. And to edge Washington just ever so slightly, Utah beats them out in seven of the eight categories, including two of the most heavily weighted, which are healthcare and education. Now, those are the he most heavily weighted because our we have done a poll of residents in those states, and they say those are the most important things to them. Um, Utah also topped the, the economy and fiscal stability categories. So overall, Utah is really just performing very well, very consistently across the board, and that brings them to the top. I don't know how you measure it, but people in Utah are also just incredibly friendly. So. Yeah, friendliness should be one of those factors. There are a lot of them. And Morgan wanted to ask about the lowest ranking states. We've talked about the top states. Why did the states that ended up at the bottom, first of all, what are they and why did they end up there? Sure. We like to shine a light on the best states in the nation to help create a model for those that are performing as well. But just as with the top states, consistency is key. And the lowest performing states really underperformed in many, if not all, of the categories. I mentioned before the healthcare and education categories are particularly important in some of the states that fall. As you'll see, Louisiana, Alaska, Mississippi, New Mexico, um, it's a really pretty, pretty similar story across the board where consistently they underperform in these categories and that drag them to the bottom. But um, we hope that the governors and policymakers in, the, in these states will look towards the states at the top of the list and make some changes for their residents, really drive change with these rankings. All right, a really eye-opening list. Morgan Felschner, thanks so much for your time this morning. Thanks for having me. Time now for our weekly medical checkup. And if you're one of the millions who use at-home blood pressure tests, you're going to want to take a closer look at these results we're about to share with you. We may have more on why they may not always be accurate, those mm. results. Important stuff. Also important, mental health among teens. It's continuing to worsen, and parents are pointing to social media as the reason for that crisis. NBC News medical contributor Dr. Natalie Azar joins us now to break down some of these headlines. So let's start with the blood pressure. There's a new yeah. study that finds many popular at-home blood pressure cuffs may not be accurate obviously these numbers are vital to people so how do you know you're getting the right numbers? yeah they are incredibly important we always tell our patients with hypertension part of the management is to check your blood pressure at home and make sure not only that you're tracking it but to make sure that it's matching what your doctor is is getting in the office but this study actually analyzed a bunch of different blood pressure cups from the arm to the wrist and they found that 84 percent of the arms were inaccurate and a hundred percent of the wrist wow. cups were inaccurate. I know, it's kind of yeah, shocking because it's like, shocking. 
Well, that's bad. <laughs> why, am I, why am I even bothering to do this? Yeah. So this is not something new. The AMA actually for the last several years has, has tried to sort of devise a set of criteria by which they can actually gauge and determine and validate blood pressure cuffs. And so my doctor's orders are this. You definitely want to do your research. And there is a place to go for this, to look for this. It's called validatebp.org. I think we were going to try to get the URL, URL up for viewers, but it's kind of easy to remember. Validatebp.org. And you can find a list of blood pressure cuffs that have been validated for clinical accuracy so you can know that what you're measuring is correct. Um, and consult with your doctor also. Remember, the old-fashioned way of doing the blood pressure with the you know pumping up and everything, that is the most accurate way. That is not how these automated devices work. You know, you just press a button and there you have your blood pressure. But if it's not accurate, it's pretty much useless. Yeah, wow, those numbers, 100% of the wrist ones. That's... Yeah, the wrist ones always kind of, yeah. I never thought they would be too accurate, but 84% on the arm, yeah, that's still, terrible. Yeah, still not great, terrible. yeah. Well, we want to turn now to the mental health crisis that's affecting teenagers. Some startling numbers here as well from the CDC. More than 40% of teens say they felt consistently sad in 2021. Now, there's also a national poll out where parents are saying that it's mostly social media that's to blame here. What are your thoughts on that? They are not wrong. About 50% of parents do blame social media for their teens' you know, mental health issues. And, and the research really backs this up, guys. Everything from like you're scrolling instead of sleeping to getting this false aff affirmation from likes. And we know how important social interaction is, not the kind of social interaction that's happening with like the, the kind of social media platforms and, and the kind of thing that they are trafficking. So what was also really important was that the number of parents who actually talk to their teens about this decreased from 91 91% to 84%. So it wasn't a dramatic drop, but still. Doctor's orders, I am a parent, I'm a parent of teens, I am by no means an expert, but what, what do we say? Have a conversation with your children. Know what, what, what are they on? Are they on TikTok, on Instagram, on you know Snapchat? And have a family social media plan. I think this is really important to say, what, what are you engaged in? Know what your kids are doing. Maybe set a time limit, but at any event, like on a daily basis, just check in. Did you see something today that made you upset? Or, you know, because there's a lot of conspiracy theories out there. It's not all bad, but it's certainly not all good. Yeah, that's, I mean, just to be talking about it and limits, if you can set any limits. My Absolutely. Goodness. There are some good things about the internet, yes. so let's talk about that, especially yeah. if you're perhaps on the other end of the age yeah. spectrum. So according to the American Geriatric Society, surfing the web might help older adults stave off dementia. Yes. That's good news. Wow. Tell us more yes. about that. So in a nutshell, um, this study looked at thousands of seniors between, seniors, God, between the ages of 50 and 65. Oh. I know. Oh my God. I can't believe I just no. said that. <laughs> and they tracked them for eight years, and they found that the um, that individuals who did engage in some um, you know use of the internet had a 50% less risk of dementia. And this, I think, is adorable. The question that they asked—that sounds so patronizing—was how regularly do you engage? I kid you not, in the World Wide Web um, and/or internet to do online shopping or to like communicate. And I just have to laugh because I remember when my mom started. She's like, "Why do I need to do?" that I can just pick up the phone she was in her 60s yeah. when the World Wide Web um, an came old about senior at that yeah point. an old <laughs> senior so the doctor's orders here are, are kind of important so screen time is is important in moderation but when they looked at, at people who were like using six to eight hours and not watching cat videos like you right. have to actually engage in some intellectually stimulating things the two hours was kind of the magic number and make it a family member so all you kids out there you 20 year olds if grandma asks you know how do I post but uh, help them, you yes, know, yes. because just engaging again. And, and we always say that seniors who have friendships and relationships also have a reduced risk of dementia. And for them, this is one way to engage with friends who live across the country exactly. who they may not be able to see. So there is some good in yes. social media. That, I will leave you with that. That can be part of your family's social media plan. Exactly. Help grandma Help and grandma me when I get older. Right. All my All kids right. won't let me go on Dr. TikTok. Natalie Azar, thank you so much. Appreciate <laughs> it. We're back with your financial headlines. Former executives from Silicon Valley Bank are set to face tough questions about that bank's collapse. Yes, yeah, CNBC's Silvana Hanau joins us with that and other money news. Good morning, Silvana. Good morning, Stephen. Good morning, Joe. Yeah, that's right. So the Senate Banking Committee will hold a hearing on May 16th into the collapse of Silicon Valley Bank and Signature Bank in March. The former top executives at those banks are set to testify, and then the committee will hold a separate hearing on May 18th, where the Federal Reserve's banking regulator and the head of the FDIC will testify. Lawmakers have directed plenty of anger at the banking industry regulators and the rollback of financial stress tests in 2018, but 
there's little agreement over whether any legislation is needed. Ford returning to profit in its latest quarter. The automaker rebounding from troubles in the supply chain and continues to command top dollar for its pickup trucks and SUVs. Ford breaking out the performance of its electric vehicle business, reporting loss of more than $700 million. Management has said they view the EVs like a startup company, which will lose money as it builds up in scale. Separately, Ford is cutting the sticker price on its electric Mustang Mach-E for the second time this year, and prices on some versions are being reduced by as much as 8%. Ford CEO says the company will have cut about $5,000 in costs from the Mach-E since its launch in December 2020. So I guess some good news for people who want it. Yeah, there yeah. you go. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Less money Save is always money. good. Yeah. Right. Thanks so much. Appreciate you it. it. All right, turning now to a story about history and a little imagination. The first black-owned children's bookstore is opening in North Carolina. It comes at a crucial time with the rising trend of book bans across the country. The family behind the store is hoping to help kids find books that represent them. Now we're joined by Victoria Scott Miller, mom, wife, and co-owner <laughs> of the Liberation Station Bookstore in Raleigh. Victoria, good morning. Thanks so much for being here. Uh, first, we know that you and your family have been operating as a pop-up since 2019, but now you're opening your first brick and mortar congratulations on that we so are. talk to us Thank about you. this idea behind your bookstore yeah so liberation station was really birthed from our children's innovation our oldest son wanted to write comic books about the adventures of langston and emerson and the first thing we thought about as parents is placement and whether or not that book would be accessible to other children that look like them will it be able to contain the narratives that would make make it available and so we went to barnes and noble and it took about four hours for us to find similar uh topics and books that were readily available for our children and we said you know we would do better and with two hundred dollars and a 2011 chevy cruise we started liberation station out of the trunk of our car you know, and in some places, it can even be hard to find very well-known books. We're talking about Toni Morrison's beloved James Baldwin's Go Tell It on the Mountain because so many schools are banning books with a focus on some of the issues raised in there. Talk about why you think it's important for kids to have access to titles like this, especially right now. Absolutely. So we are strategically placed uh, on Fayetteville Street, which is where our capital is located. We chose this location because we wanted to remember that we have a purpose. Um, we wanna be able to pay attention to legislation. And when you ban books, you limit uh, the world that children can access that could potentially make them whole. And so it's important for them to be able to have accessibility to these narratives. And that's what we intend and will do uh, with opening with the grand opening of Liberation Station Bookstore. Timely there. And Victoria, we hear that your son will actually be curating a section of the bookstore all on his own. What are you hoping for there? And what are you hoping other children get from your store? You know, I hope that uh, they are able to come in and be indecisive because everything is available for them. I hope that they can not be able to make up their minds because they have so many different genres of diasporic and black uh, creators that are at their fingertips. They will also have banned books at their fingertips. So we're paying close attention to legislation. So as books are being removed from curriculum, schools, and libraries, we will be adding them to our shelves and working really closely with Black African American AP uh, studies, African American study educators to curate the section as well. Does your son already have the vision for this section? What's it going to look like? He does, yeah. So he is really into manga right now. So we are going to have an extensive graphic novel section um, that will be uh, illustrated and authored by Black creators. And I think the, the thing that he's looking forward to is to be able to connect some of his middle school friends with this section. I mean, he's 12 now, and we started the bookstore when our children, Emerson and Langston, were three and nine. So they've grown up with the bookstore. So the fact that we get to continue to do this amazing work is really exciting and we get to bring it into the future in real time uh, in a physical space that's incredible and you're involving the whole family we love that victoria thanks so much Absolutely. for your time this morning thank you for having me have a great one welcome back expect this summer to be burning up the jonas brothers are going on tour the trio just announced their official north american tour dates and if you missed their comeback tour back in 2019 now's your chance the tour has been dubbed five albums one night so you're going to get a little bit of everything ranging from their disney days to songs on their new album called the album 
The tour <laughs> kicks off with two tour, two shows at Yankee Stadium in August. Wow. I know some folks are pretty excited about that. Yeah, uh, and a good venue, uh, too. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. Wow. Well, the 2023 Tony nominations are officially out, and Broadway is buzzing ahead of theater's biggest night. A reimagining of Some Like It Hot leads all shows with 13 nominations. It was followed by Anne Juliet, Shucked, and New York, New York, all musicals, which scored nine nominations apiece. For more, we are joined by theater writer and content creator Felicia Fitzpatrick, who we love to talk with about Broadway. Felicia, good to have you with us. So take us through the big nominations. What are the big highlights and takeaways here? Yes, I know I feel like an ESPN commentator because there's so <laughs> much to go over. Um, I think, it's like you said, Some Like It Hot was the most nominated show of the season with 13. And they're just a few shy of Hamilton's record that they set with 16 nominations in 2016. And we had, let's see, I think it was 38 shows that were eligible for nominations this season. And 27 got at least one nomination. That's so that's great. a sizable chunk. Yeah. And then for the plays, Ain't No Mo, Leopold Stott, and A Doll's House were tied for the top nominated play with six nominations, I believe. It's a lot of numbers. And Ain't No Mo, we should remind people, is the one that made so many headlines because basically yes. they only opened two or three weeks, closed because it didn't get enough attention. Exactly. You had all these people like Will Smith coming forward Will and buying Kifa. out shows. Mm -hmm. So it still got some Tony love, even though it didn't stay open. Yes, long. which I found is a delightful surprise. You yeah. know, Tony Morning, you never know what's going to happen, <laughs> but hearing them nominated for Best Play and Jordan's acting and Stevie's direction was really exciting. Yeah, that is exciting. Also had some history in these nominations, yes. some historic first. Both Alex Newell and Jay Harrison Gee became the first non-binary identifying people nominated mm -hmm. for the Tonys. Talk to us about them. Yes, it's so exciting. I feel like there's there's quite a few milestones to celebrate this year, actually, but they are such a top headline for me. They're both great people. They're both great actors. So Jay is in Some Like It Hot, and they're considered for the leading actor in a musical category. And then Alex is in Shucked as Lulu, and they're in the featured actor in a musical category and you know I think there's a lot of non-binary identifying people in the industry but because there's gendered acting categories at the mm. Tonys that's why there's been a little bit of like contention if you will um, but both of them for their individual reasons decided to submit under the actor category and they got a nomination so it's really exciting for them um, Helen Park who worked on k-pop which is another show that was yes. cut short last fall uh, she's the first Asian American female composer to be nominated and Queen Audra McDonald who <laughs> loves to set a record she got her 10th nomination oh yesterday Today. So she's tied with Chita Rivera and Julie Harris for the most nominated actor ever. And then the one that I'm, I haven't heard much about, um, Susan Strollman, who's a chore choreographer, and she did New York, New York this year. She got her 11th nomination. And so she's tied with Bob Fosse for the most nominated choreogra choreographer ever. We Which should, is a lot. That That's is a lot. amazing. Yeah. So many great things. Yeah. So we're like an encyclopedia here. We showed Alex Newell. Alex Newell we talked to for yes. flipping the script. We're going to have that interview tomorrow. And we're going to talk oh, about awesome. these issues surrounding gender and categories mm -hmm. as well with Alex. That's great. Um, snubs. We always got to talk about the snubs. I know. Not everyone gets a nomination. I know. And I'm one of those people where I'm like, if you just made art and got onto Broadway, like you should be really proud <laughs> yeah, of that. Yeah, no kidding. So the snubs are always oh, hard for me. Um, <laughs> yeah. But I, I think, you know, Bad Cinderella from Andrew Lloyd Webber started right before, like, Phantom Close. So I feel like there were big expectations, but they got shut out. Um, a Beautiful Noise, led by, um, or led by Will Swenson, got not, got, didn't get any nominations. And That's 17 the Neil Diamond one. One, yes, so Neil Diamond yeah. one. And then 1776, which was a revival from Roundabout, it was like very exciting because it was a non-binary female and trans cast, and I think people were expecting that. But it got shut out too. Wow. Yeah. All right, well, that, those are the snubs. That's a bummer. Let's make it a little more optimistic. Okay. What are your predictions for the for the winner? I, I, see, I'm not not that I'm not optimistic, but I get so stressed out predicting oh, yeah. because there's, it's, a, it's a tough <laughs> year. Tough. And I feel like we say that every year, but in the best play category alone, we have three Pulitzer Prize winning plays, an Olivier play, that a play that won the Olivier Award. So it's like... I don't even know how to choose, but I think Leopold Stott um, by Tom Stoppard, which won the Olivier, will probably pull out on top, or Fat Ham, which won a Pulitzer. For Best Musical, I think Kimberly Akimbo, did y'all did see that? Yes. It's tender-hearted, it's sweet. I it's think that, quirky, it's but It's quirky, great. but fun. Yeah, There's yeah. candy necklaces involved, <laughs> ice skating. I think that'll win Best Musical. And the, the two categories I'm actually excited about is Revival of a Play. There's three black playwrights that have their plays nominated, so it's Lorraine Hansberry, The Sign, and Sidney Brewstein's Window. The Piano Lesson from August Wilson, uh, Top Dog, Underdog from Susie Lauren Parks, and um, the, the final one is A Doll's House. And so I'm curious to see what's going to win that. I think The Piano Lesson. Um, 
And then Revival of a Musical is too Sweeney Todd. It's too Sondheim. It's Sweeney yep. Todd yep. into the woods, Parade and Camelot. So we'll I think Sweeney Todd might take it. Who knows? It's going to be yeah. tough. There's yeah. a lot of close ones this year. Felicia Fitzpatrick, we appreciate your enthusiasm. Thanks for helping Always. us break it all down. Yes, thanks, y'all. That does it for this hour of Morning News Now. Your news continues right now. Good morning, I'm Stephen Romo in for Savannah South. And I'm Joe Fryer. Right now on Morning News Now, breaking news captured. A massive four-day-long manhunt in Texas is now over this morning. Overnight, police arrested this man, Francisco Oropesa. He's accused of killing five people, including a nine-year-old boy. You always said it's not a matter of if, but a matter of when the suspects can be caught. And we're extremely glad that today was the when. We've got full coverage this morning, including more on the critical tip that led to the arrest and new this morning, the possibility of even more arrests, according to police. Money on the mind. Another pivotal interest rate decision is expected from the Federal Reserve today. Many predict we'll see another quarter point hike. This comes amid uncertainty in the banking industry and a big sell off on Wall Street yesterday. We'll take a look at what this could all mean for your money. Surge protector. This morning, the Biden administration is preparing to send hundreds of active duty troops to the southern border. The move comes ahead of the expiration of that controversial Trump era border rule known as Title 42. We're on the ground with why some migrant advocates are pushing back against the move. And Diamond Dreams, it's AAPI Heritage Month. And later in the hour, we're going to witness history at the legendary Dodger Stadium with the only Asian American play by play announcer in the Matrix. Look forward to bringing you that story. We're going to begin with breaking news out of Texas. A multi-day manhunt for that accused killer is now over. Yeah, authorities say they caught Francisco Oropesa some 15 miles from the crime scene after someone called in a tip to the FBI. And in a news conference just moments ago, deputies said Oropesa was not the only arrest made and even more arrests could be coming. NBC News correspondent Sam Brock is in Texas with the very latest. In a truly stunning turn of events, a four-day-long manhunt is now officially over. 24 hours ago, authorities acknowledging by their own admission they had no idea where Francisco Oropesa was. Now we know he's behind bars on a $5 million bond facing murder charges for killing five people, including a nine-year-old child. Now, the FBI tip that prompted this arrest came at about 5.15, led them to a private residence where Oropesa was apparently hiding inside of a closet underneath laundry. A man authorities described as a monster is finally behind bars this morning, captured in the city of Cut and Shoot, Texas, at a private home, ending an intense four-day manhunt. He was caught hiding in a closet underneath some laundry. This video appears to show the moment that Francisco Oropesa was taken into custody, authorities crediting a crucial phone call to an FBI tip line with leading to his arrest. We just want to thank the person who had the courage and bravery to call in the suspect's location. Oropesa is accused of the execution-style killing of five of his neighbors, victims ranging in age from 31 to just nine years old. Authorities say Oropesa became enraged and opened fire after the neighbors asked him to stop firing his assault rifle in the front yard. The arrest comes as new details emerge about a man deported from the U.S. four times. The San Jacinto County District Attorney telling NBC News that Oropesa allegedly beat his wife last June, prompting her to file a protective order, although the DA says she ultimately did not press charges. There were multiple occasions you weren't exactly sure how many of police being called to that property for a firearm being discharged. And then in 2022, a protective order that was filed by his wife for domestic abuse. At any point, did that prompt further investigation from your office? Yes, sir. We, we actually filed charges on him in 2022. Uh, and it, to, to the best of my knowledge, uh, they, uh, that we got a warrant for him and, uh, the, the constable went to serve him in another County because he, he left here and, uh, never could make contact with the subject. <laughs> the victim's families overwhelmed by grief. Jessica Castillo remembering her sister, Diana, who shielded her children with her body saying her sister was just starting to live her life. 
And let's turn now to the economy and a key interest rate decision expected today from the Federal Reserve. The central bank has been battling to get inflation under control, but this is all happening amid ongoing concerns in the banking sector and volatility in the markets. NBC News business and data reporter Brian Chung joins us now for more on this. Brian, good to have you with us. So first, what can we expect from the Fed today? And then will they give us any hints about what to expect after this month? Yeah, well, the expectation is that they will raise interest rates again, 10 time in a row. This will be a quarter of a percentage point, and this would essentially be to handle high inflation. Prices now 5% than, uh, more expensive than they were this time last year. The Fed wants to see that somewhere closer to 2%, which is the reason why they're continuing to raise interest rates. But we're going to be looking for commentary from the Fed Chair Jay Powell about whether or not this could be the last one. The reason being the concerns that, we've see, that we're seeing in the economy with potentially uh, the unemployment rate maybe going up, uh, compounded with the issues that we're seeing with the debt ceiling and, of course, the issues in the banking sector. So a lot going on that's really looming over this Fed decision. And speaking of the banking sector, we had that regional sell-off yesterday. All of this, the Fed meeting is coming right in the middle of that happening. How does that factor in here? What do you make of that? Yeah, well, there are a number of regional banks that, to be fair, are smaller than First Republic, which you'll recall went under over the weekend. Uh, but they were experiencing pretty harsh sell-offs in, in, in the stock market. Now, investors are not the same people as the bank depositors that have money at those uh, respective banks. But nonetheless, it underscores the shockwaves that we're continuing to experience almost two months after the failures of Silicon Valley Bank and Signature Bank in mid-March. So for the Federal Reserve, one of the issues is that higher interest rates was one of the contributors, not the main one, but one of the contributors to Silicon Valley Bank failing in the first place. So as, as they continue to raise interest rates, how do they do that without potentially breaking another bank? That might actually make the case for them after this rate hike today, possibly stopping. So we're about a year now, hard to believe, into these interest rates hikes. What has been the impact on inflation? What's been the impact on consumer wallets? Yeah, well, we, I mean, we're all feeling it, right? When you take a look at those rates that we have on the screen right now, credit card rates averaging 24%. These are highs that we have not seen in decades. Mortgage rates are very expensive. Car loans uh, are, are also expensive. So to borrow money right now is extremely expensive. And that's the point of these higher interest rates. That's the reason for why they're doing this, because they hope that's going to take steam out of the economy, lower consumer uh, demand a little bit to hopefully take those numbers down. So Americans will continue to feel the pinch. But again, this is all in the goal of hopefully making those eye-popping prices at the store uh, stop rising. All right, Brian, breaking it down. Thank you so much. Well, the Biden administration has announced plans to send 1,500 active duty troops to the U.S. southern border as COVID restrictions are lifted next week. Now, once those rules are gone, officials are expecting a massive surge of migrants across the U.S. border. NBC News national correspondent Gabe Gutierrez joins us now near the border in El Paso with more on this. Gabe, good morning. Stephen, good morning. El Paso has declared a state of emergency, and so have at least two other border cities in Texas. And as you can see behind me, there is already a large number of migrants here in El Paso, many of them sleeping in the street. You can see them, many of them just waking up right now, covered in blankets. This is outside of a shelter, and this extends for several city blocks. Hundreds of migrants and more are expected as a COVID border restriction known as Title 42 is lifted next week. After illegal border crossings hit a record high last year, this morning the Biden administration is now preparing to send 1,500 active duty troops to the southern border for 90 days. That's in addition to the 2,500 National Guard members already there. The Defense Department says the troops will help Customs and Border Protection officials with logistical support, but military personnel will not directly participate in law enforcement activities. Here in El Paso, Texas, hundreds of migrants are already camping out in the streets with homeless shelters overflowing. Some migrant advocates say sending in active duty troops sends the wrong message. It is dire in, in that sense that there, there is this urgent humanitarian need. And in the other, in the other side, we do see that there's a a failure system in terms of the asylum systems that we supposed to have in the United States. Five months ago, we saw huge groups of migrants crossing the border here. And the conditions here are miserable. But an even larger influx is expected to begin a week from tomorrow when the pandemic era border restriction known as Title 42 is lifted. It allowed the U.S. government to more easily expel asylum seekers because of COVID concerns. The policy has been used more than two and a half million times since it took effect in 2020. 
Now that the policy is ending, some border officials expect the daily flow of migrants to double. We're going to see a, a surge of migrants. I'm preparing for, you know, certainly 10,000 or so a day. Republicans say they're skeptical the troop surge will have any impact. This is far from the end-all solution that we need for this crisis. But with a backlog of 2 million asylum cases, the Homeland Security Secretary says Congress bears responsibility for failing to act on President Biden's immigration reform proposal. What a powerful example of a completely broken immigration system. We have got to fix it. We need legislative reform. Local officials here in El Paso have been asking the federal government for help for months. Meanwhile, Texas Governor Greg Abbott is reviving his controversial program to bus migrants from Texas, those who cross into the U.S. He plans to continue busing them to other northern cities like Chicago. Stephen and Joe, back to you. We'll be watching how it shapes up next week. Gabe, thank you. Turning now to New York, where the civil rape trial against former President Trump reached the halfway point. Day five of the proceedings saw two witnesses take the stand on behalf of E. Jean Carroll. Longtime friend of Carroll, Lisa Birnbach, took the stand to testify about the moments after Trump allegedly raped the writer in a department store dressing room. Well, according to her, Carroll called her immediately after the assault, saying her friend sounded distraught. She went on to say she urged Carroll to call the police, but Carroll said... She never wanted to talk about the incident again. Another accuser, Jessica Leeds, also testified yesterday, alleging Trump groped her on a plane in the late 1970s. Trump has denied accusations from both women. Leeds expressed her support for Carol following the Tuesday hearing. I would like to express my support for E. Jean Carroll with her suit against Trump. Her story rings true to me. I also would like to encourage anyone who has suffered sexual aggression to know they are not alone and they can speak up. It seems society and perpetrators won't get the message of how damaging aggression is until it becomes apparent. NBC News legal analyst Danny Savalos joins us now to break it all down. So first of all, let's talk about the strategy of having these two women testify on behalf of Carol. How much do they bolster her credibility? In my opinion, they are stronger witnesses than Carol herself because they occupy two different important points in the trial. On the one hand, you have one witness who's allegedly, uh, who's apparently testifying that Trump did this kind of thing before. It's a kind of uh, character evidence, which is normally inadmissible, but it is devastating when it comes in. It essentially shows, hey, Trump did this before. It shouldn't be a surprise that he did it again. But then you have another witness who actually locks into time that Carol may have complained or, or talked about this around the time of the assault. That creates a record. Now, it may be a verbal record, but it is a very significant record. And in my opinion, these two witnesses, more powerful for the plaintiff than the plaintiff herself, who uh, admittedly had some uh, uh, issues come up in cross-examination, like her Facebook postings, where she says she's a huge fan of The Apprentice. These are things that, look, it doesn't make her not necessarily not credible, but some members of the jury might find that to be a little odd. And there are still, it seems like, a lot of witnesses set to take the stand for Carol, including another woman who is going to accuse uh, former President Trump of misconduct. So from that, how do you think that Carol's legal team is shaping their case here? Uh, uh, these witnesses, these supporting witnesses, and I, uh, I'll say it again, they are more important to Carol's case than Carol herself, because at its core, this is a he said, she said uh, case. In a way, it's a she said and then the deposition transcript of he is going to be played in court. When that happens, if it's all the evidence you have, it's a credibility determination. But when you have these other witnesses who bolster Carol's testimony, who essentially say, yeah, she complained about that to me at the time, that makes the case more powerful. The defense is going to have to do a lot of cross-examination to counter this evidence. Speaking of the defense, Trump's legal team has informed the judge that the former president will not be testifying in this case. Not a huge surprise, but do you think that's the right move in this situation? And then knowing that, how do both legal teams push forward knowing we won't hear the former president testify? Joe, you know I hate to say I told you so, <laughs> but here I, I go. I love it. I love it, Dan. Here I go. Weeks ago, I knew Trump would never testify, and the strategy in my my mind is lose the battle, win the war. In other words, 
he's had his deposition taken. That is a known thing. It is a probably a long transcript, but, but everybody knows what's in there. So if they play snippets of it for the jury, then we know what that's going to be. So his defense team is going to think, well, there's going to be no surprises. Whereas if Trump took the stand, anything could happen and that could be bad for him. So Trump may lose the battle here in this case, but the overall war, the political war, the campaign, he can live to fight another day. All right. Danny Sabalos. Danny, thank you so much. Well, out of the writers' rooms and onto the picket lines. This morning, thousands of film and TV writers will take to the streets again. Day two of what some fear could be a long-lasting strike. The White House is even weighing in and encouraging both sides to stay at the table. NBC News correspondent Kaylee Hartung has the latest. Say power! Yeah. Outside Warner Brothers, Paramount, power. Sony, Netflix, and the other Hollywood studios, and on the streets of Manhattan, striking writers united behind a single message. Fair pay, fair compensation for our creative work. Stars like Rob Lowe, whose son is a writer, standing up in solidarity. We're only as good as the writing we get. Overnight, the late night talk shows went into reruns. Hosts like Stephen Colbert throwing their support behind union writers. These are our writers, and I'll stick myself in there because I'm WGA too, and they're so important to our show. SNL canceling Pete Davidson's hosting debut this weekend. The show in repeats until further notice. Daytime soap operas will likely follow. And if the strike stretches on, there could be an impact on fall shows. Writers like Maisie Culver say they're striking to make sure that young writers have the opportunity to make a living doing what they love. I do believe that this is an existential fight for the future viability of writing even being a career. The way that streaming companies pay their talent is very much different than the way the old school television companies paid. And the writers have sort of been left behind, in their words, on the streaming revolution. They want to turn us into gig workers. They want to remove all of the games that our, our union has fought for for decades. The Alliance of Motion Picture and Television Producers, representing studios including Comcast, which owns NBC Universal, says its proposal includes generous increases in compensation, writing the primary sticking points are mandatory staffing and duration of employment for writers. What would Hollywood be without writers like you? I mean, you're about to find out because <laughs> we're not working. We've withdrawn our labor and we will not be working until we get a fair deal that we deserve. Kaylee Hartung, thanks for that report. It is important to note that Comcast, the corporation that owns NBC Universal, is one of the entertainment companies represented by the Alliance of Motion Picture and Television Producers. Now for a check on your morning news now weather. Meteorologist Angie Lastman joins us now with more. Good morning, Angie. Morning, guys. We have another day where we've got a, a low that's stuck over on the West Coast and one for the Northeast and leaving us quite unsettled in both of those locations. Really, the middle of the country is the nice place to be today and into tomorrow. But let's talk about what we're dealing with as far as impacts. We've got more rain on the way for parts of California. We've even got some mountain snow that we'll deal with across the Sierra Mountains through the day today. And then as we shift into tomorrow, this system will start to slowly but move a little farther to the east, bringing additional snow and rain to parts of the Rockies. We'll also see the potential for a late day severe kind of outbreak that could potentially have some hail, some strong winds associated with it. But today, here's where we're looking at for those stronger storms. They do include the potential for some hail uh, as well as some, some strong winds up to 60 miles per hour for parts of Texas and extending uh, just north into places like Scott City. We'll see that included in today's potential. But tomorrow is where we really start to see that increase. It does include parts of Oklahoma, Texas, uh, with a slight risk. It includes 5 million people, that slight risk, and we'll see the potential for some damaging hail, as well as the strong winds, and even a few tornadoes will be possible into your day tomorrow. So that's Thursday. Here's the area that we'll have to watch for for the larger hail. We're talking baseball size and into the afternoon and even evening hours. This will be something that you'll want to stay connected about. Meanwhile, in the Northeast, we woke up to some rain for the interior areas. We're also seeing some lighter showers still falling in parts of the Midwest, and additionally, some of that snow falling in those higher elevations uh, from West Virginia into New England through the day today. We're going to finally start to see this low start to shift offshore. It'll take with it all of that moisture that I know lots of people are sick of, and eventually we'll be looking at some drier conditions for tomorrow. The one thing to note, the temperatures, they're not going to rebound all that fast. We're kind of still stuck in this pattern for a little while longer before we see some changes just in time for the weekend. Those summer-like temperatures are draped across the middle of the country. We're talking upper 70s for Denver. 
80 degrees in Rapid City today as well as Salt Lake City. 73 for Fargo, not bad there. Meanwhile, Chicago ends up at 59 degrees and Cincinnati just 61. These temperatures will stick around for a little while longer for the Northeast. It'll be cool as well tomorrow, just the upper 50s for New York and Boston will hit just barely 50 degrees, but it doesn't last long. If you're looking for the springtime warmth, we'll finally get that back into the picture as we round out our work week. We head to the mid 60s for Pittsburgh by Friday, jump to the upper 60s Saturday, and then low 70s by the time Sunday rolls around. So a nicer weekend on tap. We'll even get some sunshine for folks in the southwest, but the showers will be focused towards the southeast as we get into Saturday and Sunday. All right, so we got to start making these weekend plans now. Exactly. Outdoor brunch. All right. <laughs> yeah. I'm in. Thanks, Angie. All right. <laughs> Welcome back. We're learning new details on Tucker Carlson's sudden exit from Fox News and the reported role his own text messages may have played in that firing. NBC News correspondent Stephanie Gosk has that story. Hey there, as you know, reports have continued to leak out about Carlson's private messages since he left Fox, but this is one of the most striking so far. Overnight, a new report about former Fox News host Tucker Carlson's private comments after his bombshell departure from Fox News. In a text message obtained by the New York Times sent by Carlson to one of his producers in the hours after the January 6th attack on the Capitol, the host allegedly describes watching a video of a group of people he calls Trump guys violently attacking a, quote, Antifa kid, calling it dishonorable and adding, it's not how white men fight. Carlson also writing he found himself rooting for the mob. I really wanted them to hurt the kid. I could taste it. But then Carlson writes, quote, an alarm went off. This isn't good for me. I'm becoming something I don't want to be. If I reduce people to their politics, how am I better than he is? The Times reporting that the message was filed in the Dominion lawsuit, but remains redacted from public court documents. But the Times reports its contents were disclosed in interviews it conducted with several people who have knowledge of the Dominion voting system's defamation lawsuit against Fox. NBC News has not confirmed the contents of the text. The text message added to a growing number of internal issues that led Fox to Carlson's firing, the Times reports, according to several people familiar with the matter. Throughout his tenure as the lead primetime host on Fox, Carlson courted a conservative audience, often with rhetoric about race and immigration. We have a moral obligation to admit the world's poor, they tell us, even if it makes our own country poorer and dirtier and more divided. This policy is called the Great Replacement, the replacement of legacy Americans with more obedient people from faraway countries. Video of some behind-the-scenes comments from Carlson have also surfaced since Fox settled its lawsuit with Dominion. Left-leaning group Media Matters posting a video appearing to show Carlson chatting with host Piers Morgan before an interview. If we're going to talk about sex, I'd love to hit some of the fine points of technique. <laughs> Previously, the New York Times reported it had obtained a video of Carlson discussing his, quote, postmenopausal fans and referring to a woman as, quote, yummy. A representative from Mr. Carlson told the New York Times he had no comment about the alleged text message. NBC News has reached out to Fox and to Carlson's lawyer overnight about the text message report and the leaked video, and we have not heard back. Back to you. Messy situation, Stephanie. Thank you. This morning, a hopeful sign that the U.S. is hoping to cool off the heated tensions with China. At an event yesterday, the U.S. ambassador to China, Nicholas Burns, said the two countries need better communication channels. And he added that the Biden administration hopes China will, quote, meet us halfway. Those comments come amid high tensions between both countries, sparked by several events, including a visit by former House Speaker Nancy Pelosi to Taiwan, and more recently, that Chinese surveillance balloon that entered U.S. airspace. NBC News Global Security Security reporter Dan DeLuce joins us now with more on this. So, Dan, first of all, what more did Burns say and why is the Biden administration making this move now? Burns said, Joe, that the U.S. was ready to talk. It was really a pretty loud and clear signal, kind of an olive branch he was waving, saying, you know, yes, we have these disagreements, but we want, you know, these deeper communication channels to restore some of the talks they had with different departments at cabinet level. Treasury, Commerce, and the Pentagon that have that have uh, you know been uh, canceled or shut down uh, as tensions have have soared. But of course, um, you know the ball is sort of in the China in the Chinese court right now. So Dan, talk to us about the tensions that have been brewing between both countries. Is it possible for both sides to actually have productive talks despite all these problems? And, and what would that even look like? So that is the key question. There's so much mistrust on both sides. 
But I think we've seen the model in the past, both in the Cold War between the U.S. and the Soviet Union. And uh, as much as there was tension there, there were these communication channels and hotlines that did uh, help diffuse uh, tension sometimes, bring down the temperature. And then we've had uh, more communication with China in the past. And it's really in the past several years that it started to deteriorate. And then it's really gotten bad in the past maybe two, three years. And so I think the U.S. feels that there are issues they can talk about. They can talk about climate. There is some common ground there. Uh, they can talk about the global economy, even if there's a lot of disagreement about trade. There's still a huge amount of business done between the two countries. And so there is a feeling in Washington that there still is ground to talk about. And even if you disagree, you can at least understand where the other side is coming from and avoid a major crisis. And Dan, if the U.S. and China cannot mend these relations, tell us what's at stake here. You know, Joe, these are the world's two biggest economies, uh, the two strongest militaries now, and the stakes couldn't be higher. And a lot of governments and a lot of countries, especially neighbors of China and Asia, are very anxious about this. They want to see more dialogue between these two governments, because if it goes off the rails, it jeopardizes the whole global economy. And then the worst case scenario, of course, is you have some misunderstanding, some incident, a collision at sea or in the air, and you have an unintended war or conflict that nobody wants. So uh, very high stakes. And uh, we'll see if there is some dialogue that emerges later this year. All right. Dan DeLuce, Dan, thank you so much. All right, more world headlines now and some breaking news this morning. Another oil tanker has been seized while in transit. NBC News foreign correspondent Raf Sanchez joins us from Tel Aviv with this and other world headlines. Raf, good morning. Hey, Joe. Hey, Stephen. Yeah, the U.S. Navy says Iran has seized a second tanker in a week, the latest escalation in the Persian Gulf. The U.S. Fifth Fleet says a Panama flag tanker was captured by Iran's Revolutionary Guard early this morning as it passed the narrow Strait of Hormuz. Another tanker, this one under a Marshall Islands flag, was seized on Thursday. A wary ceasefire is in place between Israel and Palestinian militant groups after a night of fighting around Gaza. The Israeli military says it struck Hamas targets across the Strip in response to rocket fire. It came after a Palestinian detainee died while mounting a hunger strike. He was facing charges in Israel's military court system. And finally, in London, a man has been arrested outside Buckingham Palace on suspicion of throwing shotgun cartridges into palace grounds. Police say he was also carrying a knife, but the incident is not being treated as terror-related. Authorities also carried out a controlled explosion outside the palace walls during the incident. So, guys, a scary moment just a couple of days before King Charles's coronation. Guys. Yeah, definitely. All right, Raf, thank you so much. We've got some breaking news to bring you out of Russia this morning. Moscow is accusing Ukraine of attempting to kill Russian President Vladimir Putin. State news agency RIA reports that Kyiv targeted Putin's Kremlin residence using drones overnight. The Kremlin says the drones were disabled by Russian defenses and there were no injuries or material damage to the buildings. However, they did not provide any evidence to back up their claims, and NBC News has not verified the allegations, which again come from state media. We have all also reached out to the Ukrainian government, which did not provide an immediate response. We're back now with an NBC News exclusive. We're hearing from Allison Holker Boss for the first time since the passing of her husband, Stephen Boss, better known as Twitch. She sat down with today co-host Hoda Kotb to discuss the importance of helping others and honoring her husband's legacy as part of this Mental Health Awareness Month. Here's their conversation. Steven Boss, known as Twitch to his fans, was the beloved DJ on Ellen with the megawatt smile and signature dance moves. Last year, a few weeks before Christmas, Twitch took his own life at age 40. America was blindsided. Twitch seemed so full of life to his friends, fans, and his family, too. His wife, Allison, says no one saw it coming. It was such a shock to the country, really, when the news broke. The guy who was dancing, always happy. So everyone was like, wait, what? Why? Did you have similar thoughts, emotions, and feelings? 
I still feel like I'm like the rest of the world where I'm still shocked. No one's ready for that moment. And there's no one that saw this coming, no one. And that also breaks my heart too. But I feel so sad that he was so there and we weren't in the knowing. He wanted to be the strong one for everyone. And I think that was a little scary for him to think that he might need to ask for help. You know, people say a lot of like, what were the signs? And you know, it, he was so much love and light. He really wanted to be everyone's Superman. He said that a lot. Everyone's Superman? Everyone's Superman. He could hold so much for people. And I, I do, I think it was hard for him to process that at the end. When you have your quiet time by yourself, was there something? Was there something I might have seen or missed? Do you do that? I did it a lot in the beginning. I eventually had to tell myself that I can't change anything that's happened. Allison says she and their three children have their good days and bad ones, but they're trying to move forward. I'm looking at you and you seem very strong to me. Is that for you, for the kids, for the world? I think it's for all of them. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't really have any other choice but to be strong. Mm -hmm. Now, they still see me have my highs and lows, because there's yeah. a lot of it. Yeah. All I can do is just try to move forward. The dance duo met in 2010 on So You Think You Can Dance. Their love story was like a fairy tale from the very beginning. Will you marry me? I feel like we all felt like we knew Twitch and we knew and loved him, but what was it like to really be in love with him? Oh, <laughs> our love was magical. Yeah. And it was so real. Mm -hmm. And I think that's the hardest part about all this. The way we loved was so big. Yeah. And I got 13 years with one of the most magical humans. And I learned Oh, I'm sorry. I, I learned so much about love and gratitude. I talk to him every night. You do? I talk to him every night. <laughs> and it's different every night. Sometimes it's just like, I took the kids to school. <laughs> Other times it's a little bit deeper, a little bit more heavy. I don't allow myself to be in a place of anger or sadness, though I allow myself to feel it. If I'm feeling this much pain, it's because I've had so much love. But Allison says she's managing some tough conversations with her three children, 14-year-old Wesley, 7-year-old Maddox, and 3-year-old Zaya. What you had to explain, especially to your young children. It's honestly something I wouldn't wish for anybody. It's really hard. But... If I've learned anything, um, is that communication is key. To us, daddy's in the stars. <laughs> so we can go outside and talk to him whenever we want. Well, what kind of questions are they asking you about what happened? First off, they just ask, when is daddy coming back? And that's a really hard one. And then it'll be like a couple weeks later, like, but does he come back when he's older? Like, when daddy's older, he'll come back. But they are still children and still obviously want him here. Mm -hmm. Many struggling like Twitch suffer in silence. Studies suggest one in five adults experience mental illness each year. There's a stigma, I think, around when someone takes their own life, commits suicide. There's a large stigma that comes with it. But we don't know what's going on. Mm -hmm. I don't know what's going on in his mind. It's interesting, the word widow is hard and it's, it's never easy when you hear it. You know, the first time I ever heard it was really hard. I was like, me. <laughs> now, Allison and her family are honoring Twitch's legacy and partnered with her local branch of the National Alliance on Mental Illness called NAMI Westside LA. Talk a little bit about what you're doing and how you want your husband's name and legacy to live on. What I would really love is to bring awareness to mental health, open up the conversations, but to hopefully help people to feel comfortable asking mm -hmm. for that help. I really do mm -hmm. want to make an impact on behalf of like someone I love so much. Mm -hmm. 
Allison says she finds comfort in the outpouring of support from fans and friends like Ellen DeGeneres. To honor Twitch, I think the best thing that we can do is to laugh and hug each other. Have you been in touch with her? She has been a huge support system for me. And talk about the fun memories that we had with him. And we get to live in, in, in those great memories that we had. You were t talking about how you speak to him uh, now. Are there questions you ask him? All the time. Maybe one day there'll be this big aha uh -huh of answers. I do feel like he's with me. But we know he's guiding us through every single day. Our thanks to Hoda Kotb for sharing Allison's story. Allison is featured in the new issue of People magazine, which is available on newsstands on Friday. If you or anyone you know is struggling, you can call or text the Suicide and Crisis Lifeline at 988. Welcome back. The U.S. Surgeon General is sounding the alarm on the latest public health epidemic, loneliness. Yeah, in a newly released report, Dr. Vivek Murthy says about half of adults in the U.S. say they've experienced loneliness and warn that it poses health risks as deadly as smoking cigarettes daily. NBC News medical contributor Dr. Kavita Patel joins us now with more on this report. Some alarming stuff here, Dr. Patel. So let's start with those health effects. The report found loneliness raises the risk of premature death by nearly 30 percent with people with poor social relationships also having a greater risk of both stroke and heart disease. So how is it that loneliness can have such serious physical health effects? Yeah, Stephen Joe, this is such an important report. Report. Loneliness is believed to have both physical and mental effects on your health through a number of mechanisms, including increases in inflammation at the cellular level. That's how we see some of these changes in heart disease, for example. But it can also affect your daily habits. People who are lonely or socially isolated tend to not be able to exercise or eat well or have some of those daily habits that keep us physically and mentally healthy. So, Dr. Patel, the Surgeon General's report says the loneliness epidemic is hitting young people ages 15 to 24 especially hard. I've got to imagine social media and technology are playing a role in this. Yeah, Joe, you're absolutely right. And by the way, it's incredible because social media can be a tool of good. The Surgeon General's report actually points that out, that, that social media itself is not bad. It's how we use the social media, how the social media tools are actually put together, because what you see are young people who then forego any of those physical relationships or any of those kind of personal connections in order to be on social media. And on top of that, Joe, even with adults, some of the images in social media project these kind of false that make it incredibly hard to achieve, whether it's body issues or just even pictures of people looking so happy all the time that everyone then feels more isolated if they don't have that. And that is certainly affecting young adults and children, especially as low as the age as you mentioned, but even as young as eight years old in this report. It's so great to be talking about the effects that mental health have on our physical health, an important connection there. And Dr. Patel, just trying to treat this and prevent loneliness to boost our social connections. How can people go about doing that? Is it just as simple as picking up the phone? Yeah, so I'm going to offer some tips. First of all, it has to start with kind of small things. I, I know that the Surgeon General has some incredible recommendations for policymakers, for communities, things like libraries, community resources. But Stephen, Joe, something that all of us, the three of us can do today, think about one person that we haven't reached out to, or even somebody that you just want to text and say, I'm thinking about you. I'm, I'm, you know, I'm smiling while I'm thinking about you. Even that small act can have such a profound impact on you and the person receiving it. And then Something else that we can do, even those kind of casual interactions when I'm waiting in line for coffee, smiling and looking at someone's face and putting my phone down will actually make a huge difference as well. It's those small things that accumulate and can lead to meaningful connections. You know, uh, I think I heard it was Mel Robbins who recently said, try and text someone you haven't talked to every single day, make a strategy of doing right. that, which I think, hey, oh, Dr. Yeah. Phil, I mean, you can't write a prescription for more friends, sadly. Um, but I mean, the social media aspect of this just feels like if we just had less time on our phones, just the way it, right. it makes our brains function too, and the compulsion we right. have with checking that, right? 
That's absolutely right. We even see this in when we do brain images, not just of young people, but people of any age, that we see changes in their brain patterns. And when they replace that social media or put the phones down, put the screens down, whether it's a laptop, a desktop, and actually talk to people face to face, that we see other parts of their brain light up. And we know that translates to better health. And it doesn't have to be many people. I think sometimes I feel like I'm in a room with dozens of people and I still feel lonely. It's about having that connection with with a person doesn't need to be a lot just needs to be that meaningful connection and it does not often take place on a screen but again don't put the screens away for young people there can be meaningful ways for people to engage it's about finding them work with your family to do that fascinating and such an important conversation dr kavita patel thank you so much Welsh soccer club Wrexham celebrated its stunning promotion to the English Football League in style yesterday. They sure did. Hollywood owners Ryan Reynolds and Rob McElhenney also joined in the celebrations, parading the trophy on an open top bus in front of some jubilant fans. NBC News foreign correspondent Molly Hunter joins us now from London with more on all this excitement. Hey, Molly. So much excitement, so many jubilant fans. Thousands were celebrating in this open top bus parade yesterday. Well, this is an underdog sports story that I've been following. Many people have been following for the last couple of years for a variety of very good reasons. Well, as you mentioned, Wrexham AFC won their league. They are moving up in the world and they celebrated in style. Take a look. Overnight, there was a lot of noise coming from a very small city in Wales, a city not used to this kind of fanfare. This is what it should be like. This is what my mum remembers it like, and it's now coming back. The Wrexham Football Club in full celebration mode with Hollywood star owners Ryan Reynolds and Rob McElhenney on hand for the parade. Reynolds posting on Instagram, calling it unforgettable and bonkers. After 15 years stuck in England's bottom rings, the little team that could had a Cinderella ending winning their final game 3-1 to one and securing what's called a promotion to the sport's next tier, the English Football League. In the face of financial struggles, the team's performance in recent years flailing until 2020 put the club back on the map when Reynolds and McElhenney hatched a plan, joining forces to become the unlikely co-owners and saviors of Wrexham AFC. They're brilliant. They, they, are, they love it. They absolutely love it. Wrexham is the third oldest professional soccer team in the world. And Reynolds and McElhenney say they're in it for the long haul. If we've learned anything uh, about the town, about the community, is that they've been defying expectations for centuries. For us to, to dream as a part of this community, why not dream big? Our goal is to get to the Premier League. That's Why wouldn't it be? If we can do that, um, whether it takes five years, whether it takes 20 years, that's the goal. Dreaming big, that is the goal, as you just heard from Ryan Reynolds. Now, we aren't the only ones who have bought into the Wrexham hype. Take a look at this picture. We dug back into the archives. This is from December 2022. And on the pitch with Ryan and Rob, you see King Charles and Queen Consort Camilla, of course, very much in the news this week. I've got good news and bad news for you guys. The good news is they are playing in the States at UNC Chapel Hill in July. Bad news, you're going to have to know someone because that game is already sold out. I'll send it back to you guys. No surprise. And thanks to Ted Lasso, we all know what a promotion and a relegation <laughs> is now. So it all makes sense <laughs> to us. So <laughs> Thanks, Ted Lasso. All right, Molly, thanks so much. Welcome back. We have an update to a story we brought you a few weeks ago on an adorable 40-pound cat up for adoptions. Patches, the cat... <laughs> Now has a brand new home. Look at him. He was adopted after a post about him went viral for his new owner, Kay Ford. It meant it was meant to be. Three years ago, Ford applied to adopt an overweight cat, and her patience in adopting this big cat finally paid off. Look at him there. You can follow Patches' weight loss journey now on his Facebook page called Patches' Journey, along with his 26 thousand fans doesn't look too happy there but i'm sure he is pretty a happy. new home and a new diet yeah love <laughs> that well may is asian american and pacific islander heritage month and it's also baseball season getting into full swing the los angeles dodgers have just hired by the way the only asian american play-by-play -play announcer 
working for an MLB team. And NBC News correspondent Emily Aketa joins us now to share this trailblazing story. Emily, good morning. Good morning, guys. I'm so excited to bring this story to you. You know, you think about MLB broadcasters, and they really are the guiding voices to America's favorite pastime, sometimes more famous than the players themselves. Think Red Barber, Harry Callis, Vin Scully. Well, now Stephen Nelson will join the ranks, not just as the newest voice for the Dodgers, but also as the first Asian American to sit in the Dodgers broadcasting booth in a moment many people are calling bigger than baseball. Steven Nelson's first time on a major league diamond was at the story Dodgers Stadium. His father's love of the game and his mother's heritage brought him to Japanese community night as an eight-year-old. He still has the plaque. This has been displayed in my room since that night. Nearly three decades later, he returns to his hometown just as excited as that little leaguer with a dream. I'm Steven Nelson. But now as a member of the world famous franchise. That's our booth. That's our home for every game. The 34 year old is the Dodgers newest play by play announcer expected to call more than 50 contests as backup to lead broadcaster Joe Davis. That's three. Kershaw strikes out O'Neill to end the second inning. Nelson sits on hallowed ground, forged by a long line of venerated voices like Jaime Harin and Vin Scully. You're an announcer for the Dodgers. Has that sunk in? No, absolutely not. Growing up a fan of sports broadcasting, I'm aware of the lineage that I'm now a part of with this franchise, which means so much, not just in Los Angeles or within baseball, but in sport. But for the fourth generation Japanese American, scoring such a seat is bigger than baseball. Nelson is the only Asian American play by play announcer working for an MLB team. That's the aspect of my professional life that I'll cherish the most. I do now and I will forever. There is so much honor than that. Major League Baseball estimates just over a fifth of clubs TV broadcasters in the booth are from diverse backgrounds. For English speaking coverage, the percentage is half of that, including the Seattle Mariners award winning Dave Sims, who told Nelson. Every day you show your face, man, you represent. You're representing yourself, you're representing Asian Americans just like I do. Nelson has served in just about every role in sports broadcasting before climbing his way to the NHL and MLB networks. In 2021, he used Japanese he learned as a kid to present an award to Los Angeles superstar pitcher Shohei Otani. An international superstar is Lars Newport. Nelson building a reputation that even has the opposing team cheering him on. How would you describe Steven? Uh, a trader, obviously. You know, he's, he's, he's a trader. No, I'm kidding. Uh, you know, a great guy, humble guy. The role model for a lot of people. And so um, kids that, you know, want to get into broadcasting, play by play, um, they have somebody to look up to. The value of which Dave Roberts, the first manager of Asian Heritage to win a World Series, understands. In this day and age, we're talking about diversity, equity, and inclusion. Uh, to see him being the only one uh, speaks to how talented he is. but. Uh, also speaks to how much further we've got to go. What's your hope in this role? Try not to suck. Um, <laughs> no, I, I, I hope that I could just, this is going to sound so Asian. <laughs> I just don't want to disappoint my parents. Oh, man. <laughs> and my family. And it I never mean, leaves it you. It never leaves, no matter how old we get. <laughs> and and I, I truly mean that. I, my only goal is to make them proud. I want to make it about proving people right the people who have been there for us, who have sacrificed for us, who have helped us and mentored us and taught us. I want to prove them right. So as an Asian American broadcaster, Stephen has helped open the door. And now he says his mission, his goal is to keep that door open for oh, others. I love wow. that. What a great story. Yeah. And so happy for him. Emily, Incredible thank guy. you so much. Thanks. Appreciate that. That does it for this hour of Morning News Now. But your news continues right now. Thanks for watching our YouTube channel. Follow today's top stories and breaking news by downloading the NBC News app.